May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, Holy One, our Rock and Redeemer. I have always liked this gospel reading. I can identify with Jesus' anger. I like how human his anger is. It makes him relatable. If Jesus got this anger, this angry, then maybe it's okay to be angry ourselves, especially in the face of injustice. And there's a lot of injustice we see around us in the world today. In the Middle East, the climate crisis, and here at home, the ways that our, our communities and our politicians are imagining ways to divide us and otherize us. So we hold all of that in our heart and think about the possibility of holy anger in the face of injustice. Jesus, divine and human. Previously, when reflecting on this passage, I focused on Jesus's actions and the verbs used to describe his actions. I love verbs, driving out livestock, dumping the money on the ground, and especially flipping over the tables, overturning them or overthrowing the tables. The Greek verb is, and I am my father's daughter, so I have to talk about a couple of Greek verbs. Um for those of you who don't know my dad, he's a he's he's a clergy person here, almost ninety, and he uh, he's uh, he likes Greek Greek verbs. I'll just leave it at that for now. Anyhow, the Greek verb is anastrefo, which means to overturn or to turn over. It also means to change direction. So when Jesus felt a need to challenge the status quo in temple behavior, he prophetically and unapologetically flipped over the money table, money lenders' tables. There's no question that Jesus' action of flipping over tables is significant. It happens in all four Gospels. In the other three, in the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this event happens right before the events of Holy Week. The narrative is setting him up as a troublemaker who can be arrested by the authorities because of his actions. But here in John's gospel, it happens at the beginning of Jesus's ministry, right after the wedding at Cana, when Jesus turns water into wine. I remember as a kid wondering why they were selling livestock in the temple anyhow. I kind of tried to imagine it here, right? Tables and goats and stuff inside the church. That was where my mind went. I didn't really understand how big the temple was or what, or that animals were sold there for sacrifices, especially as people prepared for Passover. What I've learned is that the people were doing business, the people that were doing business were engaging in an acceptable cultural practice in the temple. They were doing something they were supposed to do, that they were expected to do. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus uses language about the den of robbers, which he quotes from Isaiah, not he doesn't refer to it as a, a marketplace. Carolyn Lewis, who's a pre preaching professor at Luther Seminary, argues that this is a critique that in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke of temple malpractices. In contrast, she says that when Jesus orders that, uh, um, that his Abba's house not be made a marketplace, Jesus is not contemplating about mismanagement, but is, as she puts it, calling for a complete dismantling of the entire system. And remember, this is right at the beginning of John's gospel. This fundamental challenge of the status quo is ripe for interpretation as an anti-money, anti-marketplace, even anti-capitalist message. And that's a good sermon to preach, but that's a sermon for another time. Today, I actually want to talk about the tables in the story. But first, one more comment about this version of the story in John's Gospel. 
When asked for a sign, and this is known as the second sign in John's gospel, by those who are gathered, the Jews, Jesus says that the temple will be built in three days. John helps us to understand and interprets this for us, explaining that Jesus ref is referring to his own body as the temple. Two things I feel are important to mention here. The first is that John's gospel was written after the temple was destroyed in about 70 uh, in the common era. That means that the readers, the Johannine community, which was a Jewish community, would have been grieving that event, struggling to make sense of it and their faith in the context of empire. And the, this message about Jesus' eventual resurrection would have been a crucial theme of hope for them. The second comment that I want to make is to emphasize that this was a Jewish community, albeit a community in conflict. When we read the Jews, we need to understand that it refers to the community for whom the gospel was being written. And I, I feel it incumbent on me to, to say that because of the ways that the Gospel of John has been misused for 2,000 years to justify anti-Semitism, and especially looking forward to the passion on that's read on Good Friday. So we really need to understand that when John talks about the Jews, he's talking about the community that he's ministering to. Okay, back to tables. When I teach preaching, which I do, I was just, saying before the service that I teach preaching and yet when I have to preach my own sermon all the rules that I teach so well, I use some of them but a lot of them kind of go out the window and there's a, a a big reliance on on instinct and gut that that comes into play which is something important too anyhow when I teach preaching one of the steps of preparation I encourage in my students is to sit with the reading and imagine what the story might have felt like for different characters. For me this week, I chose an inanimate object, the tables that get flipped over. I wondered what was the witness of the tables in these stories and what is the witness of the tables of our own lives? The word for table in this passage in Greek is trapeza, which means table, but it also means food on the table. So hospitality, as in come to the table, and it also means feast. And in this passage, it also means a table for money changing. I wonder if you can help me here. What kind of tables can we name? In a moment, I'm going to invite you to call them out, and I'll repeat them in the microphone so everyone can hear online. But I'll kick us off. So kitchen table, dining room table, sewing table, operating table. What else? Coffee table. Puzzle table. Online, feel free to unmute and name tables if you can think of some. What other tables are there? Night table. Communion table. Negotiating table. Negotiating table. Times tables. Times tables. Times tables. Okay, the, somebody said multiplication table. Excellent. What else? Folding table. Folding table. Cutting table. Sorry, what was that online? Cutting table. Cutting table. Okay. Picnic, I, I, picnic table. <laughs> picnic table. Very nice. I wrote down a few other ones. Drafting table. Um, quilt, quilting table. That's for you, Marty Crowder. Work table. Desk table. Canning table. And then also geographic tables like the the word mesa means table in spanish and that's a geographical uh, a, a table on the earth right or water table mm. tablespoon okay yeah measuring there's all kinds of words that have table connected to them right 
So now I'd like you to think about a table in your own life. Maybe it's a table where work was or is done. Maybe it's a table filled with tools or papers or projects undone or partially done or completed. <laughs> Maybe you can recall conversations around it and meals, maybe laughter, maybe anger, maybe tears or sadness, maybe singing, maybe all of it. Where did that table come from? What was it made of? What did it witness? Let's just take a minute in silence and bring a table to mind in your own lives and remember why it was important. And maybe in the coffee hour after church, you can share some of what those tables were for you. For me, there's a few that come to mind. I think of the table at my parents' home. So many meals, so much life. Whew, so many memories. It's a bit poignant to recall that table now as my parents prepare to leave that house. I wasn't expecting this, even though they are moving into a fabulous two-bedroom apartment that's halfway between my house and my brother's house. Or I think of the table at my home. It used to belong to Elliot Rose, who was a longtime member here. There's been lots of singing at that table. I also remember the table at a house I used to live in, my brother and I sat around it with my three cousins, our three cousins, when we were gathered for my grandmother's memorial. There was a bottle of port and lots of laughter and memories. And I remember sitting around the kitchen table at my brother's house with our family after his beloved wife, Lisa, died. We each spoke in turn saying what mattered most to us and how we were connected to her. That table witnessed a deep and holy grief that day. It also bore the burdens of, so, of our heavy hospitality as we sat Shiva, the Jewish mourning period, to remember Lisa. Those are my tables, and they're multiplied in the times table of our community by all of the tables that you remember. Tables are at the hearts of our lives, aren't they? Like the table we heard about in the poem by Ed Edip Kansiver. Thanks for reading that. It has everything on it. Keys, flowers, eggs, milk, light, sounds, bread, and weather. Thoughts, desires, those we love and those we don't, and the list goes on. The table in the poem has endlessness on it, and even the pouring of a beer. I love the line in the poem that says, it didn't complain at all about the load. It wobbled once or twice, then stood firm. The man kept piling things on. What a table. Let's return to the gospel and, in the, and the implied tables beyond the story itself. We know it as the time of preparation for the Passover, the sacred Jewish festival that happens around a table. And then there's the table that is anticipated, and somebody named that today, at least when we read it and reflect on the implications of Jesus being himself the temple who was raised up in three days, we recall the communion table itself, our table right here. I think of this table, this one, along the lines of Cancivers table. It has room to hold everything. Our joys, our griefs, our anger, our conflicts, our celebrations, our very life as people and as community. And isn't that the point? We bring our broken, struggling selves to this table every week 
And we are assured through the actions of our shared meal that we are loved by God. Our brokenness is not a barrier to inclusion. All are welcome at this table. This table is at the heart of our lives. But what about the money changers table that Jesus flipped over? Those tables were also at the heart of the Jewish community that gathered at the temple. They allowed a necessary commercial interchange to take place that was crucial for the thriving of the community. Yet Jesus flipped them over. He overthrew them. So what is the implication of this reversal of the status quo for us? What does it mean for our tables, for our table? Jesus' actions invite us to consider how we might need to challenge the status quo at the heart of our lives. Tables represent that heart because they claim space in the heart of our lives. When we examine what is at the heart, what is at the center, when we flip it over, we might discover we need to change directions. Remember that changing directions is another meaning for the Greek verb to overturn. Anastrefo. In what ways could our tables be more inclusive, more welcoming? How could they affirm difference, provide nourishment, both spiritual and physical, and promote the love that is at the heart of our faith? And by that love, I don't mean superficial or romantic love, but an unconditional love that is built on equality, transformation, and liberation rooted in the reciprocal love between the divine and humanity, loving God and loving our neighbors as ourselves. Do we practice that love at our tables at home? It moves me to have Jim Ferry preside today at our table. There were times when Jim was excluded from this table. And our own table has also been a table of disobedience at times, following in Jesus' good footsteps. So we can continue to ask, do we practice love? Agape is the Greek word that I'm looking for here, that hard work at this table? Or do we need to flip it over? It's heavy, that'll be quite a lot of work, to find out how it needs to be transformed. How do our rites, our liturgies, the thing that are at the very heart of our community need to be changed? How do they exclude others? How can we do better? How could we better embody the zeal for God's house that Jesus invokes? Holy Trinity has long been at the forefront of interrogating our practices as Anglicans and as Christians. Jesus' provocation in this passage invites us not only to hold fast to that commitment, but to deepen it in an ongoing examination of our own practices and priorities, both as a community and as a particular as and as particular people in our homes, in our lives. How do we continually turn over our tables at home and here in this place? How do we ensure that we are sharing with everyone, that we are committed to God's vision of abundance for all, that we love God's creation in the midst of climate catastrophe, that our homes and, our, and this church are places free of racism and sexism and homophobia? How do we continually come back to this table with our broken selves to eat and drink together that we might then go out and work with Jesus empowered by the Holy Spirit as co-creators of God's beloved community? Friends, let's recommit ourselves to this vision right now as we pray together as we sing together first, as we then pray, and as we gather for our Sunday spiritual meal. May it sustain us as we go out into the world to enact love and justice. Amen.